Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second lecture in the series. And my subject today, under the general theme of music, imagination, and experience in the medieval world, is chant as cure and miracle. And I'd like to begin with the life of a saint. Now, this is a kind of medieval writing that very few people read now. I think that's fair to say, outside universities, outside the academy. But these te texts really can shed a great deal of light on the way people thought, lived, and imagined in the Middle Ages. And the one that concerns me is the life of an Italian saint called Bona of Pisa, and it was written over 700 years ago. At one point, the author relates how some very gifted singers, who seem to have been traveling as a, as a band, so to speak, came to a church, perhaps rather like this one, a very large, capacious church, and began to sing a chant. They were good at it, so they thought they'd do it, no doubt for a devotion, but also because they wanted to hear their own voices in a resonant space they didn't know. And according to the author I'm following, they were so struck by the sound of their own voices fading into nothing in the vastness of that church. They were so struck by the passing away or transitus of their music that they began to ponder the fading of all earthly things, not just voices, and entered a monastery together. Well, perhaps they were thinking of the biblical text that you may know, Wisdom 4.18, our time is as the flitting, the transitus of a shadow. There may perhaps be something in the claim of the 15th century composer Adam of Fulda that music is a philosophy because it is a continuous meditation upon death. It hath a dying fall. Well, I imagine that most singers of the medieval church, when they thought seriously about their task, accepted that theirs was the music of mankind on the long march to death and doomsday. A trek that surely they, they probably thought as they looked back over their shoulder to our first parents, Adam and Eve, a trek that cannot surely go on much longer. But as I discussed in the first lecture in this series, what was waiting for the virtuous was an eternal life of song in the physical and breathing body, which is why the first lecture in this series, which you can get, of course, on the internet on the Gresham site, was called The Stations of the Breath. So today, I want to talk about plain song in the Middle Ages and the body in this life, a life, of course, often afflicted with pain and care, but I'm also going to be concerned with chant and the wondrous, if you like, the miraculous, and not all wonders, as you'll see, are pleasant or reassuring. Now, when monks, nuns, friars, and clergy stood in the choir stalls to perform their plain song, they didn't think that if you counted all the visible singers present, you counted everybody who was performing. The thin curtain that hung between this world and the next was constantly stirring, you might say, in the breath of singers, that division between the natural, the supernatural, between this life and the next. And that's because the angels were believed to be present in the building, keeping company note by note with their human counterparts. And now and then, it was even possible to catch the sound of them, as perhaps if you've ever had the experience in a dark and empty church or any dark and empty building, you may suddenly sense that you've seen movement out of the corner of your eye, but when you focus your senses, there's actually nothing there. Well, so it often was for medieval singers. We have many accounts of this. They thought they heard it, after they had themselves stopped. It went on for just that little bit longer. Here, for example, from the, one of those lives of the saints I mentioned a moment ago, is a passage from the life of someone called Pietro de Murone, who became Pope Celestine V in 1294. He built an oratory on a mountainside, one of many attempts that were made in the Middle Ages, I'll have some of those a little bit later, to baptize, you might say, waste or empty land by establishing a chapel there for prayers, for chant, some kind of liturgy. You could bring, as it were, deserted uh, spaces into the Christian world 
by planting a hermitage or a chapel on it. And that's why there are so many remains in the landscapes of Britain and of France and other European countries of isolated chapels and oratories that have long since fallen from use. According to his biographer, this is Pietro di Marone, and I quote, a great sound of office chanting was often heard in that place, in that mountainous place, and sometimes in the cell of a certain brother. And the things sung were readily intelligible. One brother often heard the sweetest voices mixed with the sound of the monks while they sang the office, so that when the monks ceased, those voices could still be heard. Well, voices heard in a lonely chapel in a wild place that are not clearly unsettling because they were angelic. And for the men and women of the Middle Ages, it seems, as for Caliban in the Tempest, even wasteland could be full of noises that hurt not. But sometimes, as you could guess, experiences of angelic singing with that anticipation of heaven that came with it had a visionary intensity. Here's a passage from the life of a saint who was for a long time a monk at the Cistercian Abbey of Le Mans, northwest of Paris. I quote, he saw an infinite number of angels. They were divided into two choirs on either side of the cross with faces turned to one another, all without exception, offering it the most wondrous devotion. Both angelic choirs sang Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. The aforesaid soul approached that company of angels and listened to their singing with the most careful attention. He also delighted in their wondrous music that were it to be unceasing, he would think himself in the eternal felicity of heaven. Once the sweet music of the throng did cease to be audible, the abundance of sweetness that he had recently perceived in that angelic singing so overflowed in him that from then until matins he could think of nothing else nor even pray. Notice in that account how the angels have arranged themselves like earthly singers in two facing choirs to perform the Kyrie and the Christe eleison, which, as many here will know, is the first ordinary chant, as it's called, of the Latin mass. Heavenly beings were quite happy to, seem, to sing the same things as earthly singers, and in the same way, it's almost as if heaven needed no liturgy of its own, because it shared one with singers on earth, hence the easy transaction between an earthly person in the choir stall and the angelic presence at his or her shoulder. Now, since the angels could be heard singing, if one listened very hard, joining their voices to those in the choir, it was possible, obviously, for those angels to teach new chants to earthly singers, a kind of angelic singing master. Here's an example from the life of Bishop Harriulf of Langer, who died in the year 722. Here it is. The following should be inserted, which is reported as having been seen on the vigil of Christmas Day. Harriulf saw a heavenly light filling the people's church, and having stood there for a long while with his eyes cast down to the ground, he stood up and saw the most beautiful form of St. Mary sitting upon the altar, contemplating the little saviour of all that she held in her lap. And there he first learned, through angelic melody, the antiphon, quem vidistis pastores dicite, go and tell that which you have seen, shepherds, which he afterwards sang very often. So there you have a physical manifestation of the Virgin Mary and Christ sitting on the altar as if it were the first kind of available space in the choir that wasn't occupied. A visitor from the next world, so to speak, just sort of relaxing as the chant goes on. Well, other stories recount how a most unlikely or unexpected person was able to compose a chant, the implication being, as you can imagine, that they were able to do it with divine aid. 
In one very famous case, which is going to lead to our first musical example from Timothy Reynolds, in one of the most famous cases, um, a blind man was cured of his blindness by singing the antiphon he had composed himself at the altar. It's the responsory, Gaure Maria Virgo, which is quite a, as you'll hear, quite a, an elaborate, substantial piece. In some versions of the legend, which was very well known, the event is associated with the dedication of the Pantheon in Rome, a building, of course, which has left a very strong impression, I realize, looking around this church on the ceiling and on the pillars here. Uh, the dedication of the Pantheon, originally, of course, a, a polytheistic, or if you prefer, pagan building in Rome to Christian use by Pope Boniface IV, and that was in 609. The story relates how the blind man has been angered by Jewish denials of the divinity of Christ and the virginity of his mother. So he challenges a member of the local synagogue to meet him on the Feast of the Purification, that's the 2nd of February, promising that he would witness a miraculous cure. The day comes, the church is full of people and clergy, and the blind man, who of course can't walk without guidance, it asks to be guided to the altar. He's taken there, and facing the altar, he sings the responsory he has composed, Gaude Maria Virgo, and is miraculously cured. His sight is restored as a reward. You may have picked up in the verse of that the words, Eruescat Judeo sin Felix, let that unhappy Jew blush who said that Christ was born from the seed of Joseph. There's no denying that that particular chant became drawn into a certain rather poisonous vein of anti Semitism in the central Middle Ages and became especially involved with something called the blood libel. You may have come across this. This is the appalling and obviously false charge uh, 
that Jewish communities, often in major Episcopal cities like Winchester, for example, um, or Norwich, had stolen or kidnapped a Christian child, submitted it to various kinds of torture, and then murdered the child. This is the story that Chaucer tells as his prioress's tale, and which Chaucer describes the pilgrims all being very taken by it as a very kind of sentimental and a very beautiful story. It's quite remarkable when you look at the history of criticism on Chaucer's prioress's tale, how different, of course, the tone of the criticism is after the end of the Second World War, when, of course, so many things in the world had changed, including uh, the view one took of anti-Semitism. The story in Chaucer's Prioress's Tale, as you almost certainly know, is of a Christian child who is both kidnapped and murdered, but continues to sing after his death so that the Christians know where the body is found. And in various versions of the story, that chant that you heard is the one that the corpse of the child sings. It's a, a dark chapter in the history of the medieval West. Well, chants could also serve as a kind of conjuration. They could summon the dead to appear. In one account, St. Augustine, no less, is conjured to appear by the last responsory of Matins on his feast day. So you would work through the responsories. And when you got to the very last one, as a kind of climax, Augustine made an appearance himself. Here's the quote. On one occasion, on the feast day of St. Augustine, while the 12th responsory was being sung, that same glorious bishop appeared. He showed himself above the choir in the most splendid raiment with a lively face and eyes shining like two stars. There's no sense of alarm in that. This bishop from fourth century Hippo in North Africa manifests himself in the church as you're singing in his honor and it's an altogether wonderful and miraculous thing, but it confirms what you thought you knew all along. God is God, and he has his saints. Now, such conjurations through chant could go badly wrong, really badly, for the apparitions were not always holy, were not always benign. You can imagine, can't you, the devil and his minions resented the singing of monks and clergy and did all they could to disrupt it as the singers set about what was called the work of God, the Opus Dei. There were times, in other words, when the chant and its liturgy pro provided no protection from Satan's wiles, quite the reverse. Now when monks, and they often do this, described the monastery as a mirror of paradise, they didn't forget that extraordinary moment, that literary masterstroke in the book of Genesis, where the word but, but has never carried greater force. You may remember it. You have the description of Eden and how wonderful it is, and then you get, but the serpent was more artful than all the creatures of the earth. To describe the abbey as a paradise was to admit that the serpent was no longer pacing outside like a hungry wolf outside the fold, but was inside. He was there in the choir stalls. He was there in the dormitory. He was there in the single room with a fire where the monks warmed themselves, the calefactorium. We have a remarkable text I'd like to introduce to you called the Book of Revelations by a Cistercian named Risham written sometime in the 12th century, and it allows us to overhear monks in conversation. And they're talking about their dread of supernatural evil, which seems to infect everything in their experience. They fear, for example, that the demons are actually talking to one another in the voices of birds. In other words, you go out into the monastery garden and you hear the piping of birds, but you doubt what it actually is. It could be something else. They're afraid that the demons are communicating with one another in the thunder. Audivi voces ex tonitru, says one. I've heard voices coming out of the thunder. And the devils inhabited the monastery like a kind of shadow monastic community with duties of disruption assigned to them by their satanic superiors 
and the choral liturgy was the heart of their diabolic work, as it was for any monk or cleric. One passage of the book that I've always found especially striking actually has a senior devil, so to speak, rebuking some junior devils because they're not working hard enough. They're not being scrupulous enough. It's a kind of ghastly parody of an abbot disciplining young monks. The devil says to his subordinates, why are you idling, running around like fools, occupying yourself worthlessly here? Why are you not at mass? Well, the devils within the monastery had many ways to disrupt the plain song. After all, a voice in action is actually, isn't it, a very fragile thing. What's actually involved is as delicate and in some senses as unreliable in certain conditions as a little reed on an oboe. It's a little piece of organic material on which everything depends. One trick they could play, of course, was to make the monk so hoarse that he couldn't sing. They could give him a rumbling stomach so that instead of thinking he'd got a digestive problem, he might think that he was actually possessed, his body inhabited by a creature other than himself and making a noise so that he would begin to panic. Now, a story of this period, the 12th century, tells how one brother began the invitatory chant for the office, only to find that a demon had made his voice harsh so that he croaked like a raven when he opened his mouth. And a fellow monk swiftly made the sign of the cross over him, and the devil disappeared, and his voice recovered. Now, that's a fairly simple operation, you might think. You could banish a devil much as you could brush a spider off someone's scapula or cloak. That's a very mild example. But as the monks, nuns, clergy, and friars stood in the choir to chant, they could be assailed by manifestations of a much graver and more horrible kind. In many of the stories, for example, that have come down to us, it's the animal world that breaks into the choir stalls as the demons assume whatever shapes they please. A nightmarish world of fur, horns, bristles, and claws erupts into the church, evoking the wilder country beyond the monastery or the filth and dirt of the farmyard or the cow buyer or the pigsty within the walls. So a bear, yes, a bear, materializes in the chancel area, crying out in a human voice as it staggers to and fro between the singers, looking at them in full in the face as they gawp and gape. Monkeys and cats are seen sitting on the shoulders of the brothers, and Satan himself, making a kind of satanic guest appearance, slithers out of the choir in the form of a serpent and in the full light of the lamp, so you cannot miss that he's been there. Phew, I think you'll agree that we need an exorcism here. So here is one. And it's musical, of course. In the year 1322, the northern magnate Thomas of Lancaster, Thomas Earl of Lancaster, was executed for his part in a baronial opposition to Edward II. And a cult grew up around his tomb at Pontefract. And an unofficial liturgy was devised. I say unofficial because Saint Thomas of Lancaster was never actually officially canonized. Since there were many miraculous cures at his tomb, the creator of this uh, prospective liturgy adapted a chant for Saint Nicholas, who was a great healer. The shedding of Thomas's blood gives health to the sick, runs the Latin text. Oh, how the cures of diseases reveal the sanctity of that holy leader. Hospitati date grotos precum tom effusio, comes pius mox languetum adest in presidio, relevantur ab in firmis in firmis suffragio, Sancti tome quod monstratus signorum indicio, vas regale tucidatur reni pro remedio. 
Well, if you feel that that chant, if you feel that that chant restores a little peace, or indeed a measure of sanity, medieval singers would, I think, certainly have agreed with you. But they looked to the power of, of chants like that for a great deal more than restfulness or calm. The central Middle Ages have left us an astonishing number of accounts of miraculous cures during the performance of a chant. Now, we've already encountered one of the most vivid, the case of the blind man who composed a chant and performed it before the altar in the Pantheon in Rome and was cured. But there are many others. Here's a passage from a Franciscan chronicle, so this was written by a friar, concerning the miracles of one of the most renowned of all the medieval saints, Antony of Padua. The eyes and tongue of a necromancer of Padua have been torn out by demons during one of his conjurations, but they're restored during one of the ordinary chants of the mass. I quote, since he was greatly troubled in his heart for his sin and fault and was unable to confess it, he decided to entrust himself entirely to the help of St. Anthony. When he had remained for many days and nights in the friar's convent in prayer, and the friars were singing Benedictus qui venit in nomine Domini, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, the priest raising the host at the elevation, his eyes were restored anew in his head. While the choir sang Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, finishing with Dona Nobis Parcem, give us peace, God in that place restored his tongue and his power of speech with which he extolled the great deeds of St. Anthony. Well, here is another grain of sand from this vast beach, this endless beach of medieval story. The Middle Ages are often thought of as the great age of cathedrals, the great ages of faith. Having been a professional medievalist all my life, teaching students, I have to say for me, the Middle Ages, it is the great ages of story. There are tens upon tens of thousands of stories and anecdotes, some of them published, but vast beaches, to keep that metaphor, uh, still in existence, but unpublished, lying in manuscripts, yet to be read. So here's another. This took place in Venice. A woman from Corby in Picardy, crippled since birth, has taken the cross with her son and made her way south. This is an early 12th century story, as I say, so what's happened is she's gone on crusade. We think, don't we, that crusades are essentially a matter of armies. Crusade, by the way, is not really a medieval term. A, a crusade to a medieval person is an armed penitential pilgrimage on, undertaken at the bequest of the Pope. It's not really a crusade. They don't use that term terribly much. And what's more, many people go on crusade, not just armies. And this is a woman who's done it, and she's crippled and she's done it with her son, making her way south, of course, to Venice, which is one of the great places for taking ship for the Holy Land. She comes to the church of St. Nicholas of the Lido and spends days in prayer. I quote, the miracle I have to tell you was not accomplished without the witness of monks or laymen. Many of us saw it. I was present there for the octave of the Feast of Epiphany, singing Vespers. Notice the liturgical precision. That happens all the time in these stories. And also the sense of witness and testimony. I quote again. I can confirm that when the convent of monks had completed Vespers for the aforesaid feast in the choir, they approached the relics of Nicholas in procession, singing the antiphon, O Christi Pietas, Oh, the mildness or mercy of Christ from the liturgy of St. Nicholas, according to custom with clear voices and see what happened. The woman 
touched with the hand of divine mercy, was stretched out and lay as if dead for half an hour and did not breathe. Those of us standing by were then astonished to hear her bones crack as if they would shatter and her sinews stretch with a sound like parchment being screwed tight. Then she woke, felt nothing, and was healed. This, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is so much of this material, I really don't know where to stop. It is endless. Here's some more. From southern France, a woman is cured during the singing of an antiphon. While the choir of monks was singing the Vespers psalm for the feast of St. Vivian and the antiphon, Omo iste fecit mirabilia in vita sua, this man did wonderful things in his life. After the Magnificat, this cripple who was seated before the choir immediately began to stretch his contorted limbs and crying out loudly, he began to extend them straight. And so it was that he who came on four legs returned to his lodging on two. I'd like you to hear that chant that you just heard for Thomas of Lancaster again. And when you've heard it, you'll see why. Well, with that in your ears, I ask you, what do you suppose medieval men and women thought had actually happened when someone, for example, was cured of being a cripple? And that very vivid description of the crackling sound of the sinews and the bones coming straight is something that's described very, very often. And I'm sure it would be very interesting to hear a medic and their opinion about what was actually taking place. But what did they think was happening? How, how did the music do this? Well, that piece you heard, for example, I think you'll agree, was very restrained and balanced. It's, it works by there being one note, essentially, per syllable. The lines all have 15 syllables, and they all end in this eo rhyme. So everything is this slow procession towards the final rhyme. It's a very organized and harmonious design in sound. So you probably think that what I'm going to say is that the, that kind of effect the kind of power that that has over the nervous system of organized sound, the kind of power that music has, is what they thought was doing it. Well, yes and no. When theologians discussed this question, and they did, how does this come about? They often took the view that because devils are actually spirits, they don't have any bodies. They can't actually be affected by music. So if someone has a, a, a disease that is brought on by, for example, a, a malign power, and you realize, of course, that in this period, the, the boundaries between what we think of as the medical uh, and, and demonic possession, the boundaries between those two things are very, very fluid. They, they tend not to say that music is the answer because, of course, the, as I say, the devils are spirits. We come closer, probably, to the, to the way they thought of it, in that story about St. Vivian, where the chant being sung 
has the text, Omo iste fecit mirabilia in vita sua. This man did wondrous things in his life. It's as if St. Vivian, sitting quietly in heaven, realizes that his devotees are singing to him and they are commemorating the fact that he did great things and he wakes up and thinks, well, I better do something. In other words, it's a petition. It's a petition to a saint and the saint is petitioned and agrees to act. Or indeed, God can be petitioned and God acts. Now, this does obviously give a place for the music. The music is what carries the text upwards, rather like incense rising into the vault of a church. The music is essential, the ceremony is essential for the petition to really take effect, for it to be conducted, as it were, along the wires to the, to the or ears of saints or to the ears of God. So the music is essential in that p point of view. But what they don't say is that the beauty of music is producing this result. Now, during the Middle Ages, attempts were made to harness the power of text and chant together in a very practical way, really very practical. And the way it was done was to found hospitals which had chapels. Now, these buildings, medieval hospitals, were once very common, and their names linger today like ghosts in our landscape. Spitalfields here in London, at Spittal on Merseyside, at Spittal Hill in Yorkshire. In all of those cases, the word spittal is simply a contraction of hospital. And a great many of them were founded with uh, little chapels. And it's especially t a telling development, I think, in the east of what's now the east of Europe, where these hospitals are founded at the cutting edge of Latin Christendom as it pushes its way into non-Christian territory, the making of Europe, if you like, in the east. And indeed, the favored dedication for these new hospitals was often the Holy Spirit, a suitably universal choice, don't you think, for houses that were regarded as outposts of the universal church, even though they were located in very local settlements uh, and embedded in a local and perhaps transitory context. And indeed, if it wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was likely to be Nicholas, Mary Magdalen, Thomas, Bartholomew, Lazarus, medieval travelers, lodged and patients lodged under the sign of a saint whose name evoked the open road because it was named, known everywhere. We have many of the charters that indicate the foundation of these hospitals and you can track them being founded in what's now the East. In fact, it is an extraordinary experience to open, let's say, a medieval set of charters for the area of what is now Eastern Germany. As you turn through the pages and these dated charters appear, you can see what are now famous cities starting up. Oh, look, there's Berlin getting going. There's the first sign of Riga. It really is a very, in some ways, a very moving and uplifting experience to see these foundations being made. And you can track it in the charters when they build castles and they build, of course, they build hospitals. Riga, for example, which of course today is in Latvia, but wasn't in the Middle Ages, had its Holy Spirit Hospital while the town was still just a wooden stockade. The work of the bishop, whose other initiative was to create a chivalric order, the Sword Brothers, as a standing army of occupation. That kind of went together. You build your hospital, you bring in some knights, uh, you have a liturgy, you have some knights to restore order or to establish order, and there's an outpost of Christendom. Move on another couple of miles, do the same thing again. Move on, do the same thing again. And that, in a sense, is how Europe is made. And indeed, one of the especially vivid things about this process is that Jurislaus, Jaroslaus, Prisnoboras, Mojkot, names like that, which I can't really pronounce, as you can tell, give way to James, John, Paul, Henry, and Bartholomew, biblical and Frankish names that came with the, with the colonizers. I think the making of Europe has left few more intimate traces. Now, inventories of goods contained in hospitals and indeed in leper houses, you remember that in the Middle Ages, Hansen's bacillus, which calls leprosy, was rare but had not been eradicated. Very few of these hospitals were so dilapidated that they didn't have a service book of some kind, allowing a chanted liturgy to take place. Now, you, it's only to be expected, isn't it, that an important foundation like the Hospital of saint Raymond at Toulouse should possess a missile and breviary, salt of the whole kit among its chapel goods. It's only to be expected that the chaplains of the great hospital at Norwich should receive a book of chant and missal from their bishop. But it's another matter to discover, as we do, 
that a run-down leper house at Montgeron, near Corbeil in northern France, had a liturgical book. And even though the grange of the hospital was empty and roofless for the most part, the rooms dilapidated and ruinous, the Episcopal visitors found a small volume which they invented, and we still have the inventory on a roll of parchment as a kind of missal, allowing, of course, mass to be sung. Now, in fact, the leper houses and other hospitals in the Diocese of Paris were inventoried in the 14th century, so we know a lot about them. There were 72 houses, 202 service books were listed, of which 82 had music. The 14th century, in fact, is very rich in such documents, many of them, no doubt, reflecting an uh, older usage. Uh, the, the God's House in Southampton had a Psalter, an Antiphona, two graduals. The Ospedale di San Maria di Colle had a Missal, a Nocturnal Antiphona, a Lecture in the Psalter, and so it goes on. These places had the resources for giving a full Latin liturgy, and the statutes of the hospitals are often very explicit about it. The clerics who served the Hôtel Dieu in Pontoise were to sing matins à note, that means with music, and they were to sing all the canonical hours and the mass à note with music. Foundation charters of these places, as you can imagine, are a little bit more reticent. They've got other things and more immediately practical concerns to think about, but there are references to the music. In Pomerania, for example, one hospital was staffed by a priest and a scholar who sang mass but were allowed to say the hours and vigils. Many centuries later, Charles Dickens wrote of a 19th century hospital in London, and I quote, the dim light which burned in the room increased rather than diminished the ghastly appearance of the hapless creatures in their beds, which were ranged on two long rows on either side. The scene, I should think, was not very different in many a larger medieval hospital as the sound of chant arose from the chapel altar, which was the principal therapy available once urine had been tested, poultices applied, and simples or herbs given out. And did the inmates of these hospitals, this is perhaps rather surprising, but the inmates of these hospitals, especially the leper houses, were actually classified as semi-monastic communities. They lived under a form of the rule of St. Augustine. So when the 13th century musician Baud Fastoul contracted leprosy and took leave of his friends in Arras to make his way to the leprosarium at Grandval nearby, he spoke of himself, and we have the poem in which he does so, he spoke of himself as a pilgrim, and even as a monastic solitary venturing en un désert into a waste, a waste or deserted place. Now, such meanings may seem very strange today. They really do, don't they? They imply a duty of penance and self-examination at a time of sickness, rather than the absolute right to care and indulgence that's taken for granted in the modern developed world. But pilgrimage, and monastic withdrawal provided medieval sufferers who had so few other resources with two of their most potent metaphors for giving meaning to the grave changes in their lives that sickness might enforce. Indeed, I'd like to conclude by saying that hospitals, it seems to me, were very rich in metaphor and association. And once again, the tempest comes to mind, this time the moment where Ferdinand says, the music crept by me upon the waters. I'm very conscious of quoting a passage of Shakespeare in my prose, how sublime it is to get one's tongue round a line of his, and how wooden mine seems in comparison, but such it is, I am not the bard. For reason, it was not for reasons of hygiene alone that so many medieval hospitals and their chapels were built close to rivers. Lepers are associated in a wide range of medieval narratives, especially romances and lives of saints, with cures produced by a miraculous cleansing bath in a river. And the bridges over these rivers, places that can so readily draw the mind to unexpected depths of contemplation, we have all had that experience, haven't we? Standing on a bridge, looking down at the water moving, induces a kind of contemplativeness Readers of Hardy's Mayor of Casterbridge will remember the passage where Henchard stands on the bridge and looks down at the water and is very tempted to jump in. And these sites were very often chosen as the places where hospitals were built. And there are examples throughout Latin Europe. Pamplona had a hospital of St. Julian on a bridge. A hospital chapel of St. Nicholas stood upon the bridge at Salisbury. In Modena, 
the Templars had a hospital by the bridge of St. Ambrose, while the great hospital at Paris stood by one of the bridges across the Seine. It's a remarkable thing. Some of you may have seen, I'm sure you have, those things that are called medieval pilgrim badges. They often look like very small models of stained glass windows with the glass knocked out. And these are little souvenirs, so to speak, that you could buy uh, when you visited a shrine. It might be the shrine of Thomas Becket in Canterbury. And you take them home as a souvenir, often wear them pinned to your hat. And the reason why we have so many of these things is because people threw them into rivers. They are constantly being dredged from riverbeds. Thames, of course, has produced a great many of them, but there are others. People seem to have, and if you've been through a shopping center, where there, a modern shopping center, where there is a fountain in the center of the place, people have this desire to throw metallic objects into water. Whether it's part of an ancient um, atavistic desire to placate a water god, I don't know what it is, but medieval people felt it very strongly. And rivers are the places where they throw these tokens, perhaps with an accompanying prayer. And indeed, the water flowing by the door of the hospital was, of course, a reminder of baptism. And if you look at the dedications of hospitals in medieval England, they're mostly to John the Baptist. And the water could turn the mind to prayers or vows, not least because a medieval bridge was a fragile structure likely to be carried away by flood. I mentioned Pontefract earlier. What do you think that means? Broken bridge, thank you. That's exactly what it means. St. Arnulf, a distinguished forebear of the Carolingians, is reported to have become so alarmed when he crossed a bridge over the Moselle that he cast his ring into the current, saying that he would think himself loosed from the bonds of sin the day he saw that ring again. It was, in fact, uh, swallowed by a fish. The fish was, in fact, served up to him. He cut the fish open three years later, and there was the ring. Medieval romance is full of that kind of thing, but I mention it because, yet again, you have this motif of the prayerful throwing of the object into the water by, by the bridge, by the chapel, where the plain song is being sung. It's as if people stood upon the bridge, hearing the plain song coming from the chapel, and said, again with the tempest, and this is my last remark before our last piece of music, where should this music be? In the air or the earth, it sounds no more, and sure, it waits upon some god. <laughs> 
Thank you.